my, my, the ceiling in my entryway is not, but uh, other than that, things are going well. <laughs> I put poly on my, ceil- on my roof. There's a spot where it was leaking, and I thought that would solve the problem. This morning, I thought, just to be safe, I'll put a bucket under where the water was coming anyways. And uh, hey, good job, Rick. I found where the water was coming in. So, uh, but no, it'll be good. I'll have to fix that this week. But uh, anybody loving the rain? Anybody loving the rain? All right, we got a couple people that are loving the rain. That's great. So uh, we've had a couple really dry years, and uh, ponds are starting to fill up. Uh, I think some people are ready for the rain to stop for a little bit now. But uh, other than that, we want to thank God for the rain that we prayed so hard for. Um, and so we've got some of that. A couple of announcements that are pretty important that I don't want you to miss. Next Sunday, next Sunday we are doing our church service in St. Malo at the park. Um, I'll just read this. It says, Gelf Camping begins this Thursday the 18th and going until Sunday. We'd love it if you would join us for those days of community experience. Talk to Joanne if you're interested. And remember, next Sunday we will be having our morning worships at 10 a.m. in Group Site 3 at the St. Malo Campgrounds. It is a free pass weekend, so there is no cost to come into the park. That also means that if you just want to hang out, you're not going camping, but you'd love to run into people at the... At, yeah, there we go. If you want to run into people like Jason, what you do is you can also go on Saturday and go to the beach with your family, hang out. Uh, we've got a group campsite, which is, I think that's where it's taking place, at group site 3. Just go, go to where group site 3 is. You'll probably see a whole bunch of people from church. It's a great opportunity to hang out. Uh, I'm probably not camping, but I'm going to go there Saturday and Sunday as well and uh, with my kids, and it should, be, uh, it should be absolutely awesome. So remember, it's free. It's group site 3. And uh, that's, that was the one thing that I want to really touch on. Thanks to everybody who volunteered at um, VBS. I thought VBS went absolutely wonderful. I showed up a couple times with my kids, and uh, they loved it. There was a ton of kids there. Uh, do you guys know how many kids signed up for that? Okay, so there was lots. There was very, there were, there were a lot. Um, the rest of stuff. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say is uh, on July 28th, uh, we are doing. A, there's going to be a fundraiser here at the church, a chicken barbecue fundraiser. That's also going to have Matt Falk is coming out to do that. So there's going to be some, uh, some entertainment. Uh, there's going to be some food, some fellowship, and uh, that that's going to be at six o'clock on the. Uh, 28th. Let me see here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So, so Susie Saracen has, has ha- got some back problems and she's gone to Germany. She's going to Germany to get uh, a back surgery in Germany to fix some of the issues that she's dealing with. Uh, those back surgeries in Ger- Germany go very well. I've, I've heard of a lot of people getting a lot of uh, relief, relief from pain and a lot of freedom uh, in mobility. Uh, but that being said, it's, it's not uh, very cheap, and so we want to be able to, as a church family, help out where we can. Uh, finally, pray for the Funk family as they have lost a brother, brother-in-law, uncle, nephew, cousin, in an accident this past week in Paraguay. They are thankful that both of these men knew Jesus as their Savior. As they grieve this loss, uh, may they sense our prayers and the comfort of our God. Let's pray. God, you are amazing. God, we want to start by just thanking you. You do so many incredible things. I want to thank you for the rain that's filling up the ponds, that's saturating our soil. God, I want to thank you for that. Uh, God, even, even as this morning my house was leaking, I could look at that water coming in and say, eh, you know what? We prayed for rain. We got rain because you are a great and an awesome God. God, I want to pray for those who are hurting this week. I want to just pray that you just be with them. I want to pray for our church as we continue this next week having a service uh, at the park and just a time of prayer, and I'm, I'm looking forward to what you're going to do through that time of prayer, God. And so I just want to thank you for all that you are and all that you do. Finally, this morning, as we continue our series on the armor of God, I, God, I just want to pray that you, you speak through me, that anything that you would have people hear, that they hear, and anything that I say that's not in the right direction, that you just uh, you correct me and you correct people in people's hearts so that we only get what we need to hear this morning. I love you, Jesus. You are awesome. 
Amen. Amen. Well, some of you noticed that I was wearing these fire pants this morning. If you were, that just means you weren't here last week to, to, to hear what it was all about. We are talking as a church about the armor of God. And so for the first couple weeks, it's not going to come into a huge, into, into play a lot. But, but in the, as the summer goes on by, they're paying attention. So what we have been talking about is the armor of God. Last week we talked about put on the belt of truth, I guess with firefighter gear, the suspenders of truth. Uh, we talked about that last week uh, and today we are going to be talking about, about the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, it got really hot in this gear last week um, and so I thought today, there we go, fire jacket. This is gonna. This is, I, I put a real fire jacket up here for you, but it was a little bit inconvenient and hot and sweaty, uh, so I just put the label on. I just put a label on. So this is this is it this week. I see my helper. He did the same thing. He he brought his jacket, but he did what I did. It's too hot, so he just put it over the side. So that's okay. We just put a label on. There we go. So so with that being said, let's read the passage that we're going to be going through over this summer. Ephesians chapter six. Verse 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and I always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Put on the full armor of God. And each week we're going to review one part of this message, and that's, that's why do we put on the full armor of God. Every week you're going to be reminded, why do we put on the full armor of God? And we put on the full armor of God because the Bible says that we are in a battle. I think so often in life when we go through things, we think it's just going through things. We don't recognize that we are in a spiritual battle. I think many of the issues that people face today, many of them can be, can be linked back to a time in their life where they lost a spiritual battle. The reason I say that is because as we look at this this morning, we recognize that the battle that Satan has is primarily for your heart and for your mind. We spoke about this last week about how people so often watch Hollywood video movies and they look at this Hollywood movie and they say, man, that's how the devil works. He slams doors, he shakes houses, he makes people's heads go all funny and, 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 and you know, manipulates things. And he's very physical about everything. But what I have come to realize through life and through, through my own you know, encounters with, with spiritual warfare is that the devil always starts with your mind. The devil's battle is always for your mind. He will, he, you almost only ever see Satan work in a physical form after he has already won the first battle, and that is the battle for your mind. You see, as we read through the Bible, Satan isn't called, isn't called the father of power. He's not called the father of moving things. He's not called the father of controlling things. He's simply called the father of lies. You see, Satan works by making us believe something that's not true. I look so often at the world today and I see people who, who believe that they're not good enough. You know, they, they, don't, they can't leave their home because they've got so much anxiety that they're not good enough. 
I see people who've been abused and they say it's my fault. They believe a lie that it's their fault. And I believe that what the devil does is he whispers that in your ear, basically. He, he, you, you already have a feeling and he builds on that feeling. Because as we look through the Bible, we see Adam and Eve. Satan, you know, the serpent shows up and, and the first act of spiritual war, which we again talked about last week, is, is he didn't come and say, hey, let me shake this tree and force feed you this fruit. No, nah, he's, too, he's too smart for that. She would know that was the devil. What did he do? He said, hey, did, Jesus, did, did, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? He twisted it. He got her thinking, he, got, he twisted it to start playing on her pride. You see, the pride was hers. She already had the pride. The devil doesn't give you pride. You get that all on your own. But what he does is he makes you think about it. Yeah, maybe if I eat this fruit, I'll be like God. And so he plays on her sinful self and she eats that fruit. It wasn't the devil's fault that she did it. It was hers. But she lost the war. She lost the battle because she did not have the armor of God in place. But yet, when we look at Jesus up on the mountain, after 40 days of fasting in his weakest place, he went there to be, tempt, to be tested, and the devil comes, and again, the devil doesn't slap him, the devil doesn't shake him, the devil can't just jump into Jesus, that's not how it works. The devil needs to win his mind. So what does the devil do? He says, well, every, every man has pride, and so the devil comes with a lie. And he begins to lie. He begins to enter into spiritual warfare with Jesus. And it's not through attacking him. It's through manipulating the truth. And Jesus simply responds in kind with the truth. And as we read through that, we're going to go through that another week. But as we read through that, Jesus basically simply responds, but the word of God says. You see, we are in a battle. And I want to challenge you this morning. Maybe you're going through something. And you don't know why you're going through it. It may simply be because we need more time to understand that we're in a battle. Maybe you haven't realized that you're in a battle. I think so often in life, people don't realize that they are in a battle. And because they don't realize that they're in a battle, they lose. It's a little bit like, imagine, anybody here ever watch UFC? Imagine being entered into a surprise UFC competition. Okay, this is what it means. You're in a UFC competition, but you don't know it, okay? So Conor McGregor comes up to you, and you're like, hey, it's Conor McGregor, how's it going? And you put your hand out there, and boom, you are flat on your back. You've been knocked out. He's kicking you. He's on top. If you've seen that ground and pound, and he's just pounding you, he's just pounding, and you're like, dude, what just happened? You're, you can't even think, dude, what just happened? You are unconscious. You do not know what happened, because you were entered into a battle, but you weren't aware that this was a battle. You thought it was a meet and greet in the ring, you know? Oh, hey, how's it going, you know? I get to meet Conor McGregor, like, check it out, how lucky am I? But no, you were in a UFC match, and you lost. I mean, I'd lose anyways against Conor McGregor, but I'm, I'm just saying, at least, at least I could turtle and tap out before anything happened. But, but the reality is that so often in life, we don't realize that our spiritual condition, our mental condition, our emotional condition is so often linked to how victorious we are in battle. And if we do not realize it's a battle... We tend, to, we tend to get knocked out before we realize what's happening. And that's why we have to put on the belt of truth, which we talked about last week. You need to commit yourself to God's truth. It, it needs to be the whole truth. We, last week we said the Bible is the Word of God. You need to understand that the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And the only way to know what God wants, it starts off with knowing the Word of God. And if you don't have those two things in your life, you are already unprepared. Everything else, all the other armor is going to fall off. Because it's all linked to the belt of truth. Which is where we're at today. Today we're going to talk about the realities. It's okay to know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's okay to say, yes, I believe that the Bible is true. But the reality is, believing that God is God is not enough. Believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life isn't enough if you don't actually move in that direction. I'm encouraged by what James says in multiple times, but I'm going to read James 2, 19 to 20. You believe that there is one God? So you believe that there is a truth? Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without Deeds is useless. 
And he goes on to talk about how, how you have faith, I have works. That's still useless. You've got to have faith. You've got to have the belt. You've got to have that belt of truth. But you've got to have that breastplate of righteousness. Because if you go into battle, if you go into battle, if I go fight a fire today, there is a raging fire, and I'm like, I'm safe. i got my suspenders on. Woo! We all know that the suspenders are not going to save me. The suspenders are pretty much useless if they're not holding something else in place. You, you go into battle, you're just wearing a belt, you know? It's, it's not going to bring you victory. Just imagine a police officer, you know, SWAT team kicking down a door. He's like, I don't worry. I got my tactical belt on. <laughs> Bullets, tactical belt's not going to stop a bullet to the heart. And the Bible says that we have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And so the question is, are you wearing the breastplate of righteousness today? I put a note here. I said, if Satan cannot convince you that the Bible is not true, then he will, con simply, he will simply convince you not to take it to heart. And that's a problem that we have in the world today. I meet people all the time who claim a religion. Oh, I'm Catholic. Oh, I'm Christian. Oh, I'm this. And they claim something to be their own. They claim that they have found the belt of truth. They claim that they have truth, but the truth has never, isn't holding anything in place. The truth is holding nothing in place. And I think it's a shame when you believe that you have a belt, but you're, not, you're wearing the belt, but there's no pants and, ja and jacket to go with it. Um, and I think that's, that, that's, that's Satan's goal, is to convince you that, you've, that you're fully armored up when you're just wearing a belt. You just got the suspenders on. Okay, Rick, you're ready to go fight a fire. Satan builds this great big fire. He says, you should go fight that. You got, you got the suspenders on. You're, you're equipped. You believe in the truth. You're equipped. Go into battle. And I go into battle, and what happens? I burn myself. Come out of there burned, scarred, damaged. And just like in a fire, when you burn yourself, you don't heal the same way. And we got to be careful that we don't go into battle and burn ourselves and get scarred and damaged, because that's going to set us back in the next battle that we go into. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of a kid named named Bero from Mozambique, and just, I was, it just reminded me that now about what happens when you get burnt. This young guy, he was a, he was a baby, there was civil war going on, and artillery shell hits his house, and, and, and dad, dad runs this way into the bush, says, okay, mom, mom's got the kid, and mom runs this way into the bush, and she's like, I'm sure dad's got the kid, and, and here's this little baby in this burning house, and finally when they realize that nobody had the kid, they run in to get him, the house is falling down, they get this little burnt body out, and they, they save his life. But all of the skin on his body is burnt. Literally, he, the rest of him kept growing as he got older. His body kept growing, but his skin did, had no elasticity. His body kept growing, and his fingers just slowly bent and bent and bent until they were laid flat on the back of his hand. Because if we're not careful, if we live so many years of our lives as Christians not going into spiritual battle, what ends up happening is as we try and mature as Christians, there's always that spot that holds us back. There's always that spot that, 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 that we've been bent backwards. We don't get it. And we end up doing more damage in battle than having victory because we've allowed ourselves to be complacent for so long that the rest of us has grown mentally and, and, and emotionally, but we're crippled. We're crippled in those areas. I remember taking this guy for surgery. They literally had, it literally looked like he had a wing. His skin, they wrapped him up like this, and because they were running, nobody bothered to take it. And his skin literally grew together like this. It looked like he had a wing. So his whole life, he had, a, he had a, he, just a, a flap of skin from his middle finger to his, to his shoulder blade. Somehow, the skin grew that way. And we had to get him surgery. We had to get it fixed. And it was a painful, difficult process, and he still won't be the same. Guys, it's time to enter into spiritual warfare today. Because if we don't start it today, if we wait till tomorrow, if we wait till we're better equipped, if we wait till another day, what's going to happen is when we're finally ready. You know, our fingers attached to our back. It's pretty hard to throw a punch that way. It's pretty hard to wield the sword that way. You see, Satan's goal is to engage you in battle while convincing you that there's no battle going on. So, Put on the breastplate of righteousness. I took a look at righteousness this week. I said, what is the definition of righteousness? And I kind of shortened it just so it could fit on this thing. But, but this is what, all, what I looked up. It said, the quality of being morally right or justifiable. 
So that's good. What does that mean? Well, they gave me some synonyms. It says goodness, ethical, blameless, guiltless. This is a harder one for some of us. Noble-minded. How easy is it for our minds to just run away from us? And the the dictionary says that that another word for righteousness, a synonym for righteousness is noble-minded. Integrity, uprightness, and honorable. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. One of the things that I love is that the Bible pretty much tells us what righteousness is. That's what the, that's what, that's what the dictionary says righteousness is. Let's see what the Bible talks about. When it, something, a good example of righteousness. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I don't know about you, but the Bible basically says that when we put on, well, but, but, but as I read through this, it sounds to me like the Bible saying that when I put on that breastplate of righteousness, peace is going to come. You see, the, the devil's in a battle for your mind. He wants to, he wants to make your mind run wild. He wants to make you down in the dumps. He wants to make you stressed out. He wants to make you all of these things. But the Lord wants to give you peace. The Lord wants to give you joy. The Lord wants to pour out these things into your life. And so whatever is noble, whatever is good, whatever is right, think on these things, dwell on these things, meditate on these things. And the God of peace is going to pour out those things on you. He's going to give you victory in battle when you put on righteousness. And I think that's something that we got to remind ourselves of each and every day. When we fail to live right, we create an environment for Satan and his deception. We got, I, I, somebody, I, I was listening to a video this last week, and I, th- I found it quite, quite interesting. It was from... I think it was Patricia Shire, Shire, somebody who's at that, is that the right name? Anyways, Shire, there we go. And she also did an Armor of God thing. I watched a video on YouTube, and and she had a pretty good story, and I loved it, and it it related to something that that I've experienced in my own life. So she takes her kids out fishing. Anybody like fishing? That's what I'm doing this week. I'm going fishing. I love fishing. But if you ever go fishing, go to somebody's house. Well, she had a friend who had a pond, and she'd take her boys fishing at this pond, and the guy had a rowboat. And so what he'd do is, is, of course, when you're not fishing, you pull that rowboat out of the water and you, you tend to flip it over. And one of the reasons that she never liked to fish from the boat, she'd prefer to fish from the shore, is because she never liked the, the aspect or the idea of turning the boat over. You all know why, right? Because, because you go to turn that boat over, what do you think is living underneath that boat? There's always something living under the boat. There's always, you grab that boat and you're like, okay, what am I going to... You stand back and you're like, okay, let's do this on the count of three, okay? And then you let somebody else flip it over for you so you can stand back. Because under that boat is the perfect environment for spiders and snakes and, and mice and, 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 and critters. Um, and, and when the guy flips his boat over, he doesn't flip the boat over and be like, I am building a house for snakes and rats. No, he flips over for, for his own reasons. He's like, well, I'm going to protect the boat. It's, there's a reason for flipping it over. But in that reason, he forgets that underneath that boat is the perfect environment for those critters to thrive. I'm reminded of Sand Hill Lake Bible Camp. I used to go to Sand Hill Lake Bible Camp. We used to do this as a church. Sand Hill Lake Bible Camp. And us as boys, we love to do something. I think, not, 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 not to be critical, but the maintenance department at Sand Hill Lake Bible Camp uh, didn't always clean up after themselves. Didn't always do things the right way. And the camp was amazing, but the, the cleanup crew didn't do things the right way. And so what us boys would do is we'd go around. I remember the one time we were out by, they had a baseball thing kind of out in the corner there. They must have taken down a a building down there and they didn't clean it up the right way. And so we'd go as boys and we'd be like, what is living under the plywood? You know, maybe, maybe you have a barn. Anybody, if you're a farmer and you know what happens at a farm, if you have a sheet of plywood and you just throw it all, take it off the wall and just throw it out and leave it lying for any extended period of time. Okay, you don't, you don't want mice at the barn. 
You're not hoping for mice at the barn, but you know that if you leave, if you don't clean things up the right way, if you're not doing things the right way, you create an environment for those mice to thrive. And I'm a little bit freaked out from mice even to this day because of the one day I flipped over, me and some buddies flipped over this, this board, and I have never in my life seen as many mice in one spot as, as that time when I flipped over that board. And it scared me because like over my shoes, and I'm like, it's going to go up my pants, and I was terrified. And all because something wasn't cleaned up the right way. Wasn't thrown in the garbage. And I thought to myself, sometimes the breastplate of righteousness is just simply making sure that when you've got garbage in your life, you pick it up, you give it to Jesus, you throw it out. Because if you do not, if you do not throw it out, you don't have to invite the devil in. You simply have to make the perfect environment for it to happen. And you give him victory. I'm going to give you a couple examples of how the devil could use the garbage in your life to get victory. You're looking at something you shouldn't on the internet. You're like, it's private, it's secret, it's done in my own home. Until you get caught. And the devil lets you get caught. And, and now your sin is, is in the light and your marriage is in the dumps. And the devil is celebrating because God has a plan for your life. We say this week after week, design this way on purpose. God has an incredible plan for your life. Every single one of you, God has a goal, a vision, and a plan, a dream for your life. And the devil knows that the Father in heaven has a dream for your life. And guess what? It's pretty hard to live that dream when you're fighting in your home, when your marriage is on the rocks. It's hard to live God's dream when you're fighting at home. How many great ministers, how many great preachers and ministers in the world have have let their righteousness slip just a little bit. And when it was exposed to the light, when somebody flipped over the sheet of wood, and thousands of mice ran out, thousands of sins ran out, thousands of things were exposed, and people looked at that and said, oh my word, what a horrible place to be. I'm not going to that church anymore. And God's incredible plan, God's incredible design is destroyed because somebody didn't clean up the garbage in their life. Not only that, we've got people who have bought into lies. And we're going to talk about this when we talk about the shield. But we've bought into lies. How many people are stuck at home day in and day out because they've done something in their life that's given them guilt? And it's built anxiety or frustration how many people haven't got rid of the sins how many people haven't confessed their sins and so those things weigh on their lives and the devil keeps telling them they're no good and all they have to do is confess those sins and give them to jesus and say i got the breastplate of righteousness and all of a sudden god's going to use their damage to give damage to the enemy because they know how the enemy works they've they've lost a battle and god's going to use that to help them win the war but they don't have victory and you have to get victory over the little battles before you can win the big war. And so I want to challenge you this morning that it is important for us to hold on to the truth because the devil will use every avenue in your life to bring a little bit of, a little bit of problems in your life. I was talking to somebody just this week about something that was going on and the person says, I don't trust that person. This happened, I just had a conversation the other day they said, I don't trust that person. I said, I said, what do you mean? So this, I, there's this guy, he's trying to do something really good. It seemed to me, it's, it's, they're trying to do something really good. But, but he's gone through a phase in his life where he has not had righteousness. And that righteousness has damaged his reputation. And so now, he wants to do something good, but his reputation is damaged. Nobody's called him on it. And once again, his, his work has been hampered. Because there's not enough righteousness, and people see, and the devil says, look, that guy's not wearing the breastplate of righteousness. Why in the world would you go into battle with somebody unarmed? And people go, that's right, I'm not going into battle with that guy. I'm not going to. And all of a sudden, that person's all on their own. There are so many ways that going into battle unprepared, unrighteous, can hurt you. When we compromise on what true holiness or righteousness is, we open ourselves up to the attack of the enemy. The other thing that I have an issue with in my own life and in, in, in the world today is that, is that the breastplate of righteousness no longer looks like what the Bible says the breastplate of righteousness is supposed to look like. 
So the first thing is, often we just don't have righteousness. But the second thing is, often we act like we are righteous. And we're not. We've compromised. We've, we, we're trying to wear the breastplate of righteousness without the belt of truth. We said, well, I only, believe, I only believe the Bible, sort of. So the Bible says, this is truth. And we're like, yeah, I'm just going to, don't worry, there's pants underneath here. I'm just going to, I'm just going to wear one suspender today. I'm not going to wear the whole truth. And you know what happens when you wear one suspender? The pants start falling off. The breastplate of righteousness doesn't stay in place. And we've got to be careful in our lives today that we don't compromise on what holiness is. Because I look around, even at some of the churches and some of the denominations in our world today, and they have completely done a direction like this. And the, and the devil has come in, and he's manipulated, just like he did with, just like he did with Eve, he's manipulated the Word of God. Just like he tried to do with Jesus, he manipulates the Word of God. He says, well, hey, if the church believes that, that doesn't sound very loving, does it? And he manipulates the word love so that we accept everything. That somehow he's, he's changed the definitions on us. He's switched things around and we act like we're wearing the breastplate of righteousness, but it's the devil's version of righteousness and the devil makes a lot of holes in the righteousness. And I want to challenge you, that's the second thing, is that when we compromise, we get defeated. You'll notice today that I have a name, a tag on that says fire jacket. Because the reality is, last week, as soon as it was done, I had to go get these pants off because this is, this is a little bit heavy and it's a little bit hot. Oh, I don't, I'm just going to wreck this that thing there. I'll go like this. There we go. I won't put it all the way on. It's heavy. It's hot. It's hard to move in. And it's uncomfortable. Ask anybody who's had to do fire drills. Ask anybody who's had to do fire drills. They make the guys do fire drills with the equipment on because they know if you try and do it without the equipment on, it's going to be far too easy. You need to learn how to, how to wear the breastplate of righteousness all the time. And it's not always convenient. I remember, I'm going to pick on my buddy here, I, I remember when Jason was doing a, a firefighter challenge at, in Kleefeld, and he told me, he said, yeah, I almost passed out. He said, I almost, like, almost threw up, right? Almost... Like, middle of summer, they said, we're going to do some drills here at the, at the fair, or whatever it was, in, in Kleefeld. And it's exhausting, it's tiring, it's overwhelming. But that doesn't mean you get to compromise. That doesn't mean you get to just put on a name tag that says, I'm righteous because I'm a Christian. Or even just, I'm righteous, I'm a good guy, I'm righteous. But not live righteous. I'll be honest with you, this morning, I, I, there was a time in my life where I mean, we all have times, I still sometimes have times where we do things we're not proud of. But I remember I had a group of buddies where there, there, there were five of us solid Christian kids from school. So when we were at school, we, we talked the right way, we acted the right way, we did all this stuff that was the right way. But I remember me and my one buddy, I'm not going to put his name out there, um, and, and what, we, what we'd sometimes do is when we were just by ourselves, we wanted to see if we could make, you know, a sailor blush as the, as the expression goes. And the language we would use we had a rough day, we'd be like, all right, let's get together and just do some swearing. we get together, because we could do it, because we were both Christians. And if you both get, two Christians get together, you can do all the bad stuff you want, because you're not giving a bad testimony, because there's no non-Christians around, right? There's nobody to give a bad testimony for. I know that sounds, but we all do it. We all do stuff with our Christian friends that we would not do with our non-Christian friends, because we don't want to be a bad testimony. Some of us, as Christians, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, some of us as Christians, we take off the breastplate of righteousness when we're with other believers. The jokes that we tell with other believers, the things that we say with other believers, the way that we act with other believers is not the same as we have, if, if there's somebody next to us that we want to see find Jesus. So remember the other day, I said, hey, if anybody's got somebody that they want to see find Jesus, put that name down. There must have been 40 names on that sheet. I want you to imagine something right now. I want you to imagine that person next to you when you don't want to be a hypocrite, when you want them to figure out how awesome God is. How often, even with our Christian friends, do we compromise that we, even, we wouldn't do it if that non-Christian person that we wanted to see find Jesus was next to us? I see people do it. We do it with alcohol. We, 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 we drink more than we ought to as long as we're with other Christians. You know, there's a couple jokes about that that I'm not going to tell. But, but you know, there's... <laughs> how we drink with one person or not with the other person. And so if you're with all non-Christians, you should still have righteousness. Some of, us, some of us cave. Some of us cave. Some of us find it uncomfortable to wear the breastplate of righteousness when we're with our non-Christian friends. 
So we're like, well, they know I'm a Christian, and I tell them I believe in the truth, and I got one of my suspenders on, so I'm okay. You're not. Because how ridiculous, how much, does anybody here buy the fact that this t-shirt's going to keep me safe from the fire? If I go into a fire right now, kids, is this going to save me, or should I put the jacket on? i got to put the jacket on. Your non-Christian friends, when they see your bad behavior, you're not tricking them when you tell them that, you're, that I'm a good Christian. They're not dumb. They get it. If you're not wearing the jacket, day in and day out, the devil's going to find a way to attack you. As a matter of fact, most people get attacked when they're alone. Most people take off the breastplate of righteousness when they're by themselves. You look at almost every addiction that gets get started. The guy, who's, the guy who's way over drinking, the guy who's doing, doing, looking at bad things online, all of these things are ways that the devil attacks. It's usually with one or two people. It's not usually in a crowd. It's with one or two people. It's the guy at work who's flirting. Oh, it doesn't mean not, not planning to cheat on his wife, not doing anything wrong. He's just flirting. So the devil whispers in her ear, man, you should flirt back. She goes, I like this attention. She starts flirting. Next thing you know, there's a marriage on the rocks. Why? Because a little bit of unrighteousness. It's not about sin and not sin. It's about being so equipped. It's about being so equipped. You don't put on the armor just when the arrow is about to hit you in the heart. You, these guys are walking in, in their own territory. You look at the Roman soldiers everywhere they went. In Rome, they had the breastplate of righteousness on. Just in case a zealot, a, a terrorist, if you would, in the area took a sword and tried to stab him in the heart. Are you wearing righteousness. So I want you to, I want you to imagine something. I need a, I don't necessarily need a volunteer. So do you guys ever, that's a key illustration for the kids maybe, maybe the adults will get something out of it. Okay, so you ever notice that when you flush the toilet, clean water comes in, right? Okay, so if I went to the toilet, mm, we'll use this, no, we'll use this. If I went to the toilet after I flushed it, and I filled this bottle up with clean water. So I just went to the washroom. No, no, I came prepared. I came prepared. You see, I came prepared. I got my Kleenex to get the lid off. And I filled this with clean water. Would you want to drink it? I mean, it's clean water. I got it from the toilet where I just went to the bathroom. But I flushed it, and that washed all that stuff out. So, uh... Do you want some? Anybody want some toilet water? <laughs> yeah, and I want some. Luckily, I said what if, and I didn't actually do that today because then nobody would shake my hand after. It's actually clean water. But the reality is, is that when it comes to the breastplate of righteousness, when it comes to being holy and upright, it is time for us to ask ourselves, have we truly based our righteousness on the word of God or are we compromising bit by bit by bit? Is the devil telling us lies, twisting the truth, saying that's not love or that's not compassion or that's not caring? And, and the Bible says one thing, but the devil's twisting his words. And you've got water in your life that's contaminated. That you're drinking, you're, you're, you're selling toilet water to the world, and everybody knows it's toilet water, and nobody's buying that, okay? So my challenge for you is when, for kids, when you're at school, are you treating people with respect, or are you, are you being a little bit rude? How about when that kid makes, calls you a name, so you turn around and say, "Ooh, you called me a name. Now I get to do this back. I got into a fight one time, uh, not a big fight, I got into a little fight one time, this guy came at me, and I might have defended myself. Um, and then I backed up, and I said, I'm sorry, I just, wanted to be, I just wanted to be free of that engagement, shut the door. And, and the person, they were like, this is perfect. The person was excited. They were actually excited because they, they didn't really like me that much, and they had the opportunity to attack me with weapons. And I'm like, well, what's going on? Like, because they said, well, you started it, so now I can do whatever I want. Like, you offended me, so now I can kill you basically was the idea. You offended me, so now I can kill you. And how many times as Christians do we contaminate the water of revenge? Somebody does something to us that we don't like, and we're like, all right, I had to be righteous until then. But now, now I get revenge. The truth is, is that holiness 
is holiness all the time. Imagine one more time my water. Imagine instead of putting dirty toilet water in here, I opened up a fresh bottle of water, opened it up, perfectly clean, took an eyedropper or one of those little droppers and just took one, one drop, I went to the Voss's barn and I just took one drop of the water flowing down the, down the, down the drains there. One, 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 one drop of manure water and I put one drop of manure water in there. I don't think anybody would still want to drink it, would you? The whole thing could be righteous. The whole thing could be good. But the contamination goes through everything. It's a, it's a little bit like when you bring a motor home that's had a couple mice in it to the insurance company. Hey, if you ever had a motor home that gets this, they, they don't go, well, looks like the mouse just was over there, so you should be fine. They normally go, whoa, 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 whoa. If there's one mouse, you've opened the door for a thousand. And if he's peed over there, he's peeing everywhere. The whole thing is contaminated. The whole thing is a write-off. And I don't want my life to ever be a write-off in the eyes of the world. Finally, righteousness is not simply avoiding doing wrong, but also pursuing what is right. It is living out God's calling in your life and doing all you can to love God and love people. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Righteousness. The very foundation, the, the, the steel in the armor of your righteousness. The steel in the armor of your righteousness is not what you don't do, but as much what you do. Are you loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you willing to put on righteousness in the presence of your friends who are out at a wild party? Are you willing, are you willing to say that, that just because I'm the DD doesn't mean I can do everything else at this party? I think, I think we know just because I'm the DD doesn't mean that I can do everything else at the party. You still have to be, you still have to be righteous in everything. Are you being righteous? And are you loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength? And are you loving your neighbor as yourself? You see, the foundation of the breastplate of righteousness is love. That's really the foundation. That's really the steel and that armor. But it's biblical love. It's not earthly love. It's not the love that the devil tries to sell us that lets every kind of idea and mentality go by to say, hey, I can't, I can't tell anybody they're wrong because that's not loving. Tell you what, Jesus loved us and he still made a consequence for sin. Jesus loved you more than you've ever been loved in your life and he still has got a consequence for sin. Because love has boundaries. It creates boundaries. So finally this morning, I'm just going to conclude it this morning. Maybe you're here this morning, you're going through a tough time. You're losing a battle, emotional battle, mental battle, and you're losing that battle. And the question for you is twofold. Have you decided that you're going to follow Jesus? Is he the truth? Is the Bible truth? Have you been willing to read it and accept it and obey it? And the second one is, comes to that, obey it. Are you living righteously? God has called us to believe in the word and to live it out. What areas of your life do you need to be obedient or righteous? And give up things that could hold you back. Unforgiveness is not righteous. Unforgiveness is not righteous. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to forgive somebody. I'm not saying go back into an abusive situation or a damaging situation, but you need to let it go to God. Is God calling you to do something for Him or others that you still need to do? I don't care how righteous you look. I don't care how nice you are. I don't care how much you avoid sinful things in your life. If God has called you to do something and you don't do it, you can have no sin in your life. Disobeying God is still a sin. And so if God's called you to go serve somebody, if God's called you into ministry, even if God's called you to go overseas and you don't do it, you're not obeying God. And just like with my kids, if I ask them to do something, 
It's disobedient. Just because they're not punching each other in the face and they're not telling on each other all the time, just because they've done the dishes and the floor, if I ask them to do something and they don't do it, it's disobedient. It's not right. It's not righteous. God has an incredible plan for you. And as you listen to Him, you will experience more than you could ever imagine. You want victory from peace, from, from, from anxiety, from these things. Yes, you might have to go see a doctor. You might have to do some of that. But have you tried the first step? And that is righteousness. One last thing, just as a, as a, as a challenge. I'm reminded of somebody who just a couple years ago I was visiting with them. And they said, I got so much anxiety. I got so much anxiety. I got so much anxiety. I just, I got so much anxiety. And this is just a, a one particular situation. It might not apply to everybody. I got so much anxiety. And, and I said, what do you think God wants you to do? And they said, I think God wants me to go serve in a certain area. I said, well, then you just have to say, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into battle, and I'm going to hopefully my anxiety will be, we came up with some steps. What did they do? They went off into battle. They went off to do what God told them to do, and they had such victory over their problems because God set them free. God gives you a purpose. God gives you a plan. God will give you victory from anything that's holding you back. So if there's something holding you back today, I want you to bring it to God. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come to the front. We're going to pray this morning. I'm going to pray. There's going to be a couple moments of silence in the prayer. Those moments of silence in the prayer are simply for you to listen. To ask God. And to, and, and to ask God the same things that I'm asking in my prayer. Finally, this morning, if you're new here, we got this time in the front where we do some worship songs. And we have a prayer time. You can be praying. You can come up to pray for anything. It doesn't have to be in response to the message. You might just want to talk to Jesus and you want, want someone to pray with you. We're going to do that for you this morning. So let's pray. God... Is there anybody in my life right now that I am bitter with, angry with, and have not forgiven? God, give me the courage to forgive them and the wisdom to know what that relationship should look like. God, is there an area of my life where I'm not right with you. God, is there an area of my life that I am not right with you? Is it sin? The beginning of sin? The temptation that I'm giving into? God, give me the courage to honestly confess that to you, to repent and go the other direction. God, is there something you are asking me to do that I have yet to do? Is there an act of right living, an act of service, an act of love, an act of compassion that I can do this week that I have not done that you want me to do, God? Finally, God, we prayed a couple weeks ago for the people we want to see saved, the people that we want to see come to you, God. God, What do I need to do to go into battle this week for that person? I love you, Jesus. You're so incredible. God, and you know the areas where, my, where, where, I, have, where I have felt it inconvenient to put on that jacket. I felt it too hot, too uncomfortable, too sweaty to put on that jacket, God, and I want to confess those things to you. God, this morning, as we look to our future, as I look to my future with you, you're calling in my life, God, I want to just pray that you give me the courage to do what is right every single time, that you give me the courage to go out into my life and to flip that plywood, to flip that garbage that I've left lying on the ground, to stop those mice, as scary as that can be, because I know you're going to protect me, God. God, I need victory in areas of my life, and I believe there's other people who, do, who, who need victory as well. Give us all the courage to bring it to you in prayer. God, I love you, Jesus. Thank you for giving me the armor that I need, showing me how to put it on, and protecting me. In your awesome name, Jesus. Amen. Let's bring everything to Jesus this morning as we pray.